Ah, yes, whether you are uh, an esteemed person and walking with the Lord and full of his word, you'll enjoy this today. And whether you're just new to the Lord or anywhere in between, just because it's the word of the Lord that gives life, you're going to enjoy this. We're doing the allegory on the allegory. Well, what book could that be other than the Song of Solomon? And we're doing part two. We did part one last week. And I want to bring about some other things. I'm having an event, which is probably going to be an annual event on the Song of Solomon, the way that I do it with the allegory as God gave it. But for this part, in this part of the series on the broadcast, we're doing the allegory on the allegory because most of the commentators and most of the best work on the Song of Solomon, it always deals with the allegory. It allegor allegorizes what is already alleg an allegory. It gives metaphor to the metaphor. And for the way that God brought me and that's, that's to say that the way God brought someone else, as long as God did the bringing, it's valid. But for the way that he brought me, he gave me to understand the word as he gave it before I make this mean that and make changes or show other applications. First, let's get the application as God gave it. And we will do that at my annual events and at, at uh, the, I call it SOS, mainly because it's SOS we know to mean help, help. And I used, used to call it SOS, my hormones are working, because we know anybody that reads Song of Solomon recognizes it's a pretty steamy book. And um, But most of the commentators only deal with the first two chapters. You have to almost go into Judaism to, uh, to find the full book done. And I'm talking of um, not of modern times, because in modern times, since it... Since the time I've been saved, there's been a commentary on the entire book. Many look the way I have over the years and over the decades and see that uh, this it always shortens up. It always stops at a point. And so the allegory on the allegory and what I mean by that, I want to show you how that it's valid just because you're going to see one commentator say one thing and another commentator to say another. If the commentary is good. And if you're learned, you know how to check behind the credentials to know if the source is good. And if you're, if you're new, the Holy Spirit will bear witness in you because that's what he promised to do. And he does that new uh, coming along or old, but the Holy Spirit will bear witness in you. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, a stranger they will not follow. That doesn't mean that God corrects every single error that we make. God corrects every single error that we make in faith. You, you can know that when you look in the love, it, pardon me, in the faith chapter that we call Hebrews 11, you'll see the story of people and you'll see what they counted by faith. And you'll find that God always speaks well of his children. He doesn't tell of the times when you're going through the story when you look in Genesis, when you look in Samuel, when you look in Kings, when you read the story that he's talking about, that he's counting his faith, you see that there were some mistakes made along the way. You see that the men and women of God did some things that should not have been done and God corrected it. And that's where I have a saying and I actually do a course on it that what you do in faith, God will correct. God will adjust. And I, when the course, I show you that sometimes you know of the adjustment and sometimes you don't. But because it's done in faith, God does an adjustment. It's just that you don't want to have to live through not doing what God said the way God said it. One of the examples is, um, and I'm, I'm not moving away from allegory to the allegory because there's some things that are in here that the allegory is there because someone who was counted as righteous did things a certain way and it wasn't Yahweh. It wasn't God's way. And yet God still moved and he still adjusted it so that what was done by faith could count as righteousness and stand up as righteousness. And we see that in this book. So it's word, it's scripture. And we need to understand that. And we need to understand this principle that I just shared with you, that what you do in faith, 
God will count it as faith and he will adjust it into righteousness. He will adjust what's done by faith. Now, that's why the, the Apostle Paul said, the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He had plenty of faith of his own, but he understood that he, he could be prone to error. Uh, in one of, one of um, the letters in scripture, he wrote that I haven't, I haven't taken any man's good. He dealt with covetousness, rather because that was a personal problem that God had delivered him from, or rather because when you, when you look at the um, Ten Commandments, uh, and you compare one to six and uh, two to seven and so on, you see that uh, that that is a that is one of the main things that the Ten Commandments have to do with after loving the Lord your God and loving your neighbor as yourself. And they, loving your neighbor as yourself, almost all of them have to do with coveting. So metaphor on the metaphor or allegory on the allegory, God, when God gives an allegory, the allegory is what the allegory is as God said it. And, and that's not a problem. But it can be a problem when we do an allegory on the allegory before we even know what it is that God had said. Now, I'm going to show you some things. And this will be easy. But one of the things, for instance, the fountain or the spring of water. As a matter of fact, there are three uh waters or or a uh, way that the scripture brings water in song of solomon there's the fountain or the spring of the gardens there's the well of living waters and there's waters that flow down from lebanon and they each uh, have a different metaphor attached to them just the way god gave it but when you do the allegory on the allegory then you have a couple of different things and they are truisms they are true in the lord they will be true that's the difference between following the word and following what we can come up with and what we can make up with it you don't just make up an allegory just because you can think of something you use only the things that god has approved kind of like the book of esther uh it was approved by the Lord that it be part of the canon, that it be part of scripture. Every book, every ancient book that every prophet wrote is not part of scripture. The book of Enoch, God testifies that, that Enoch wrote, but the book of Enoch uh, is lost forever. The one that we have today is, is, is not even the real book, but God did not preserve it to scripture. The scripture talks of other books that he did not preserve to his word. There are things that happen in history uh, Abraham's history that are not part of scripture. They're part of history and we know about them. Well, especially Jews know about them, but we don't have it recorded in scripture. And, but God has recorded this generation of heaven and earth, the things that are eternal and the things that are for this generation of heaven and earth, they are whatever part of the word. So, now let's go back to just looking at the allegory on the allegory. I'm going to show you that the allegory on the allegory is correct when it's God approved, even when it might be opposite or completely different from something else in another allegory of the same thing. What do I mean by that? And this is why I'm giving you this, the allegory on the allegory on the Song of Solomon, because it is a metaphor. It is an allegory as God gave it before you even put something else to it. But if God has given some, his mind to understand some other applications. So the journey of the soul, many have a uh, question and some don't even think about it. If you're one that didn't think about it, don't worry about it. God has given you some other things to think about, but the journey of the soul and the difference between the mind, the heart and the spirit, the difference between the soul and spirit and so God has given some, some instruction and understanding in his word and revelation in his word on the soul of the soul and the spirit, the Ruach and the Nefesh. And, um, and so the journey of the soul, if you're dealing with that terrain, if you're dealing with that subject, if you're in that arena and, and you're in Song of Solomon, actually, let me back up. Let's say the terrain or the the areas of allegory that you can deal with the subject the song of solomon is the journey of the soul another one can be israel 
and their history, mostly their ancient history, so that you're going to deal with them coming out of Egypt, you're going to deal with them at Sinai, you're going to deal with them in exile. So you have, so far I gave you two different arenas, that the allegory on the allegory is going to be completely different, but completely accurate. So, the journey of the soul will be one, and the allegory will be different. The history of Israel will be another, and the allegory on the allegory will be different. And, uh, I'll quote Proverbs to say the way of a man with a maid, and the allegory on the allegory will be different. Now, here's an example of what I'm talking about. So, we have in the Song of Solomon already... In a metaphor and in an allegory, God talks about the fountains or the springs of the gardens. He talks about the wells of living waters. And he talks about the waters that flow from uh, the mountain of Lebanon. Okay? So these are three different representations that God gives. And the allegory doesn't stay the same when you move from the journey of the soul and you're dealing with... Uh, the, the journey of Israel, or ancient Israel, with God. Or when you're dealing, and the, the metaphor doesn't stay the same, when you're dealing with a man, with a maid. Now, the Song of Solomon, I hope you already know that it is a set of songs. I like to give it as a play, but it isn't a play. A play has Act 1, Act 2, Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. And it goes in a different order to tell a particular story. And while the songs tell a story, this metaphor is a group of songs that you can understand the story, but it's not Act 1, Act 2. It's not that way at all. It's a, it's a group of songs. And it's the song of songs. The same way the Holy of Holies is the Holy of Holies. The same way that Jesus is Lord of Lords. It's above all songs. And I mean the collection, the book that made scripture. And it's not about us, it's about God. And we're going to look at this, the allegory on the allegory, so we don't trip our way through and we get the beauty of what God wants us to know in this book, the Song of Solomon. Song of Songs. Okay, there's still time for you to get your ticket for Song of Solomon, the VIP luncheon held in, in the Bravo restaurant in the Lehigh Valley Mall for Saturday, June 20th. Now, there's going to be two sessions uh, that you need to choose which one you want to be in. There's 11 a.m. and, and 1.30 p.m. at Bravo, Song of Solomon. We're going to deal with the sensual part of it and showing the holiness as opposed to lust. 
and we're going to show what God wants you to know in the Song of Solomon, the way of a man with a maid. So make sure you get your ticket. There's still time. Lehigh Valley Mall, Bravo Restaurant, choose your time, 11, 30, 11 a.m. or 1.30 p.m. Tickets are $40. You want to be there. All right, God bless you. Now we're looking at the Song of Solomon. I want to give the allegory on the allegory because over the decades, all I ever teach is the man and woman portion and the allegory, the other allegories that God has given, they're important as well. Just because God gives me to deal in one doesn't mean that the other's to be negated. It's kind of like if the hand knows what it is, doesn't mean that the arm doesn't mean something, doesn't mean your hair is not important, doesn't mean your eyes are not necessary. So we're going to look at the allegory on the allegory. And I just gave you an example of how the three ways that you see water in the Song of Solomon, the fountain or the springs, the well of living waters, and the waters that flow down from the mountain, they are each very different in the book, the way that God gave it. In Song of Songs, Song of Solomon, the way that God gave it. But depending on which arena, which dimension, and which allegory you're dealing with, it's going to mean something different. And I gave you the example of a man with a maid. I gave you the, and that's the one I most always deal in. I gave you the example of Israel's history, and I gave you the example of the journey of the soul. So let's just look at how it's going to be different and yet accurate, even when it is different than another allegory on the allegory. And mind you, all of this is the allegory on the allegory that God has already given within the book itself. So when you're looking at, for example, uh, in the history of Israel, and, and even there, the, this has the, the three ways of water it means one thing when it's talking about the people and the allegory has something else when it's talking about specifically how the land was divided and the process that was going through to know anything before the Lord. Now, there was, a, a I think, a th four step process, but at least a three step process. The, the, the uh, high priest. Uh, went to God, put the question before God, and asked in the breastplate, the Urim and the Theorem, and God gave the answer. It would light up, for those of you that don't know, and for those of you that already know, to refresh you, that there were the uh, precious stones and semi-precious stones on the breastplate, and one for each of the twelve tribes in rows. And uh, the, it would light up according to the answer and the high priest. Now this was the high priest only that wore the, that breastplate. He knew what the, what it meant. He knew what each one meant. He knew what letters it represented and what the message was. God gave him that. Some of you need to understand, even in fivefold ministry in Ephesians, that the scripture says he gave gifts unto men. Who is he that ascended that also descended? Uh, that's in Proverbs, and he answers the question in Ephesians, and he tells us that he uh, he de he us descended, but that he ascended, and then he gave gifts unto men, and he, and that's doreon, not charisma, not charismata, but doreon. These are gifts are only ever people, and he says apostles, prophets, part uh, uh, evangelists. I missed, I missed event. Yeah, apostle, prophet evangelist pastor teacher these are gifts unto men the people are gifts and that is from uh, the way that god gave it from the beginning and the you should know that the levitical priesthood is not the beginning of god giving these things giving hierarchy in this way and giving people as gifts in this way but with that doreon with that gift is the authority and certain equipment, or I call furniture on the inside, that goes with it. Certain things that go with it. So with the high priest, what goes with that is the understanding when God speaks. 
and being able to rightly divide and decipher and know and understand and receive, not only receive the revelation, but also discern the revelation and disseminate the revelation, give that revelation to the people, the ability to do that. Do you know that if everybody stands up and starts reciting, say, the 23rd Psalm, some people will listen. But if another somebody does it, people will stop. If another somebody does it, people will keep on going by. And that is that has to do with, we like to call it in, in the New Testament times, we like to call it the anointing that's on you. And that's not inaccurate, but there's more to it than that. So the high priest part of the furniture, part of the operation, part of what he had going on with him being high priest is that he understood when God lit this stone and lit that, there's only 12 stones, there's 22 letters in the alphabet. I'm talking about the Hebrew alphabet. And then there's vowels and vowel points, but he had an understanding that when God lit this, it meant that. And when he lit this in this order, it meant that. And so the fountains uh, or the springs of water in the garden are are likened to the Urim and the Thurim. When you go to God, when you when you give the high priest a question and you go to God, he goes to God on behalf of the people. Understand, he's not going to God for some, uh, uh, should I do this today? Should I do that today? No, this is for the people. Most of you know that the armor of God, now I tend to teach that the armor of God is the what the priesthood garment, not so much the Roman soldiers. And here again, not that that's incorrect, but the armor that God had was way before there was such a thing as Rome. Not that you can't use the Roman soldier, that's fine. But if you understand it from the priesthood, you're going to understand some other things about who God is, how God is, and what he's doing with you and what that is in your life. And um, so here it is, the fountain or the springs of garden are, are allegory on the allegory, are likened to going before God and getting that answer through the Urim and the Purim. And then, Thurim, pardon me, and the well of living waters, that's the inspirational, that has to do with the casting of lots. Uh, because God is the one who said in his word, in Proverbs, he said, um, you don't cast the lots, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Now, ancient Israel knew this better than anybody. Now, the whole world understood this principle, even if they weren't giving the living God, Yahweh, Elohim, uh, credit for this. They understood it as a principle back from Adam that uh, when God speaks, if you cast a lot, it's going to come out according to what he has ordained, according to what he has destined. And that's what God's talking about in Proverbs. He says, you know, the whole disposing of that is, is of the Lord. You cast a lot in the lap. So in the, in, when it was time for the children of Israel to decide who, uh, what land, you know, does Zebulun get what? Does Dan get what? What part of the land? And they, they had a council about it. That's another, another of the bodies of water. I'll show you in a minute. But one of the things that they did is that they would put all of the names on, on a tablet, on a, on a tile, put all of the names of each tribe and then all the different pieces of land. And then the leader, most likely Joshua, he would, would, they'd shake that urn and then pull one out and one would be the tribe, and then they'd pull another one out, and then one would be the land. And why would it always be that way? Because the whole disposing thereof is the Lord. And then it would, it would be one tribe for one track of land. And then the one for the track of land would speak. It would actually, that's why we say that it's mystical. It's more than just man, so that you know that man didn't do this. It would actually speak. And then, so that one is, is the well of living waters when you're going through the Song of Solomon and you're looking at the history of Israel. So you have the fountains or the springs that the allegory on the allegory is Urim and the Theorem. You, the well of living waters is what's mystical, but the inspirational. It's mystical, it's spiritual, but it's inspirational and usually directional. It has wisdom attached to it. And then the water that flows down from, from the mountain, that's um, 
my way of saying it is that's what's calculated now not calculated in a bad sense but through wise counsel how the scripture says that through wise counsel make war so that when the sanhedrin or the elders uh got together now you know that the sanhedrin was um made up of of uh the 70 that uh when Je when uh moses father-in-law came through and showed him that you can't judge the people all like this all by yourself and for those of you that don't know the story i'm giving you all of these different scriptures so that you can go in and delve into these things and get yourself all steeped in and kneaded into the word of god so that when you go to song of solomon these principles are in you they're in your mind they're in your soul they're in your heart they're in your spirit so that the song of solomon will talk to you and the allegories won't be difficult because they're from things that God has already said, that he has already given. And you don't have to go back to kindergarten, as it were, to understand what's middle school material. And so, um, the wise counsel, that is the waters that flow down. And you're going to see why that, that isn't something else, because he's, he's, he gives this. Now, if you look at the same thing, the living springs, if you're talking about the journey of the soul the fountain of water is where the the soul has its presence in the presence of god hasn't made it to earth yet hasn't made it into the mother's womb at this point this is talking about the soul and so that's the spring of the living waters because why that is the the very presence of god himself without any distractions whatsoever in heaven and then the well of living waters, now that's the fountain of the springs of the gardens. The well of living waters is the abode of the soul before birth. And I know in these modern times, we like to, uh, with um, uh, human rights and all of that thing, we, we debate all kinds of things. But God actually has these things in his word for us to know. If we would go back to being a godly nation, we would see these things in his word and we would not trip over them and have so much trouble we might have debate we might have conversation but we will come out as god says the next thing the lots the whole disposing of thereof is of the lord so uh but that is the well of living waters and then the waters that flow down from the mountains that's birth that's the soul entering into what i call the planet being born into the planet that last step and actually, it's not a last step because then it has to live out the purpose and the destiny. But do you see how the same things, the same things that are already an allegory, the springs in the garden, the, the wells of living water, and the water that flows from the mountain, they're in the book, they're in the Song of Songs, and they're already an allegory. But if you do an allegory on the allegory, then they have different meaning. If you're dealing with the journey of the soul, then if you're dealing with the history of Israel. And then I'll share this one with you. I'll be sharing this one tomorrow at the, uh, at the luncheon, the VIP luncheon. I'm laughing because uh, God embarrassed me. I found out that God doesn't mind embarrassing you sometimes. And I don't mean in a negative way, but uh, kind of in a way that you can chuckle, which is why I'm chuckling. But one of, when God is, is talking about the way of a man with a maid, then the fountains of the living water, and I need to read it because it always, it kind of, my children when they were young used to, to giggle all the way through Song of Solomon. Uh, and this still, I'm grown, been grown for a, decades, and it still makes me kind of giggle. But when you're dealing with love and passion, these same waters, these same three different waters in the Song of Solomon have a different metaphorical, allegorical uh, meaning. So the fountains or the springs of the gardens uh, he's, uh, is where she, he, <laughs> where we, I'm trying to read my notes here. They're turned upside down is what I put here. And the well of the living waters are the mystical or the all. And the, by the way, these things are supposed to stay. While in the book, this is not married people. And I get to show you why it's not a marriage. And I know people like to say, and you'll read commentaries on that. But very clearly, um, 
this isn't marriage. They are betrothed. It's only marriage if you're looking at it in a Middle Eastern sense that when you're engaged, what we call it in the in the Eastern Western world, we call it engaged. When you're engaged, you're not married. You haven't consummated a marriage. You're looking forward to being married, spending your life together. That there there is not a marriage going on in Song of Solomon, but there's things that are in place that are supposed to continue into your marriage. And what's happening with these living waters is. So the fountain or the springs of the garden have to do with that love and that passion. The well of the living waters is the mystical awe that causes you to be one. Why you just love that one. Why they're better than any other one. That 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 uh, uh, is a water and a watering thing and it waters your relationship. And then the water that flows down from the garden, that's the things that you understand, those are the things that are finite between you. And that all of that is to be in place, but it's an allegory on the allegory dealing with the love and passion. So we'll continue. Well, you cry and you cry all alone at night And you try and you try to hide from the daylight Hoping no one will see Wondering if they will see in your face the night before And you run and you run, try to fly from it all Searching and looking for a way out Can you find in the day Part of your soul, a reason to believe This is the time to believe again This is the hour to receive God's plan No more suffering alone with burdens that are too hard to bear Jesus is here to give you hope Jesus is here to give you joy with his arms open wide and with eternal life Jesus he is here right here mm -hmm. don't leave stick around I know what it looks like now, but God can do anything. He will meet your need. Yeah. Okay, we're looking at the Song of Solomon, and we're looking at the allegory on the allegory. It's difficult to get into the book without understanding that the whole book is a metaphor the way God gave it in the first place. And he gave it concerning a man and a woman and the passion and God wants us to know some things however even though the name of God is not in the book at all one of the two books in the whole entire Bible that you cannot find God's name the other book is Esther uh, God is so much there and the book is about him even though you don't see his name there at all and here is what he wants us to know some things about his presence. So the allegory on the allegory, God gives a song of songs and he lets us know it's a set of songs. And we know and the scriptures testify that Solomon was a songwriter. Solomon was a botanist. He was several things and excellent in every single one of them. Excellent to the point that any one of them could have been the only thing that he ever did. And it would be totally, totally excellent. And he was world known for all of the different things that he did. He did choirs. He invented uh, things that, that weren't even in the earth at the time. So these songs, not just was he a song, not just is this the song of songs, the best set of songs that Solomon wrote, but it, it is scripture and it is the highest song. And as I shared with you earlier, the allegory is that it is the holiest of holy. It is the, the song of all songs. 
And there's some things that God wants us to understand about entering into the Holy of, Holy of Holies. One of them, and we know the scripture, let, um, enter into, into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. When you're in the Holies of Holies, this is not um, a time that you're in remorse for your sin. Yes, remorse for sin, there's a place for that. God calls for that. But no, Holy of Holies, <coughs> pardon me, that's a place to come with joy. That's a place to come with worship. That's a place to come with uh, divested of yourself. You, you're not even interested in you. You are so much full of love that you are not full of self. It is the holiest of holies. And so it's it comprises all of the fear of the Lord. That's in the, the uh, sense of fear and reverence. And it's in the sense of awe and wonder, both. The holiest of holies or the song of songs. So all of this is in this book. It's in this scripture. It's not just the best song that Solomon ever wrote. I'm a poet. And for some of my poems, I won wonderful awards. And for one of my poems, which I love to share with you, um, I won poet of the year. But that's this isn't about Solomon. It lets you know that Solomon, it's, it's Solomon's in here. And he wrote them. But this is about the holiest of holies, the wonder of wonders, and the fear of the Lord in all of its wonder, even in love and passion. Now, I'm going to deal mostly with Rashi, and Rashi doesn't deal with the love and passion part from the human standpoint. God wrote the metaphor from the human standpoint. So when I'm doing my events, I do it from the human standpoint. But I want to show you Rashi because it's so important. Rashi was um, a, a sage and a, a rabbi. And in his time, he saw that Israel was going into apostasy. So he saved as much of the oral Torah and as much of the um, ancient writings that were of God and from God more like commentary, we would say today, only on a different plane than what we mean when we say commentary. And he, he preserved them. Uh, not every single word, but much, and, and much of different opinions. Uh, when I say different opinions, here again, I'm talking about when God gave this perspective to one prophet or to, to one sage, and another perspective to another, as I just showed you, the allegory on the allegory. The same thing, the same water can mean something different if you're in the arena of the soul than if you're in the arena of, of love and passion between man and woman. Then can mean completely different if you're talking about the history of Israel. And even with the history, okay. So Rashi preserved all of that when he saw that Israel was going into apostasy. And so I'm dealing with you from Rashi as I deal with the allegory on the allegory. So he shows you that let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth um, that she, now in the allegory on the allegory as Rashi is using, it's the she, the Shulamite girl is always Israel. It's the people of Israel. And Solomon is Hashem or God, the living God. And so it's the relationship between God and the people of Israel. And here again, when I'm teaching this thing from the perspective that God has given me, I'm always showing you that it's, on the, it's about the presence of the Lord. It's about the presence. It's about the way of a man with a maid. You see, most of us in the Western world, we know how it is the effects that a woman has on a man, whether she's a good woman or whether she's a Delilah woman. We, uh, we understand that and we give more attention to that. But the scripture, Proverbs says that one of the wonders is the way of a man with a maid. So in Song of Solomon, we have it that way. It's the way of God when you're dealing with Rashi, when you're dealing with the allegory on the allegory. It's the way God is with Israel. So you're going to see that Israel goes through all these different changes. And yes, the Shulamite woman does. The Shulamite girl, as a matter of fact, the scripture calls her girl. She goes through all these different changes. And it looks like she's going through puberty at the same time. And if any of you remember puberty, you know you went through some changes. And let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Um, she recites this song. Remember, this is a set of songs. And uh, in and she's in her exile, in her widowhood. Now remember, this the she 
in this allegory, on the allegory, is Israel. So while Israel is in Israel, while Israel is in exile, Israel is remembering their king. Israel is remembering how it was, how it was so good. Even some of you who might be divorced, um, usually when people are, are separated or divorced, the marriage wasn't good. But there's some of you out there that you had a wonderful marriage. And then what happened? You know, you're separated or divorced now. And this is, this is the allegory on the allegory that Israel's in exile, mostly because of, of the things that they didn't do right. And so they're in exile and they're remembering their king. They're remembering their God. They're remembering the love of the Lord God. And they're longing for him when they're in exile. And sometimes it can be like that. That when you, when you had it good and you didn't know, or you had it good and you th knew that it was wonderful, but you let something come in and make a wedge between you, and now you're off in some other place. And you, then you remember when you're not there, and you remember how good it was, how wonderful it was, how wonderful he was. And so because in some places they uh, kiss on the back of the hand or they kiss on the shoulder, depending, it, the, the uh, tradition is different. What we all can understand is that the kiss, the kiss on the hand is for reverence. The kiss um, uh, on the cheek can be... Uh, uh, family, it can be, it can be a closer friend, but ah, uh, the kiss of the mouth, that's intimate, that's personal, that's God talking to me. You know, some of the prophets, they said the word of the Lord came to me. Some said from the mouth of the Lord, ah, uh, that's that personal. When, when, when they're in exile, they're not hearing the prophecies and now they wish they'd listen and they'd love to hear a fresh word from the Lord. Uh, one of the prophets said to another, is there a word? <laughs> is there a word? And we, we know that there are those times. There's times in our lives when we feel dry and we haven't heard from the word or the word of the word that's right by our bedside, the Bible that we read every day. And if you're not, you should be. And uh, Yeah, yeah, you should be. Uh, d don't should it anymore. Just do it. Um, that word that needs to talk to you. And it's not talking. You're reading, but it's not talking. Usually that's because we're encumbered with many things. Remember that phrase from Mary and Martha? Usually we get encumbered with many things and then we read his word and it's not talking to us. And it's not because it's not talking to us. It's because we're off in exile. We're, we're dealing with necessary things. We're people that love the Lord. We wouldn't be dealing with something that's just nothing. No, it's necessary, but we're, we're, we're just off. And I, I let, I'm letting you know now that it's off in exile when, when you're in that dry place. And so longing, longing, longing for that intimacy. And um, like the bridegroom with a bride, mouth to mouth. The intimacy is mouth to mouth. And remember, I showed you uh, on the allegory on the allegory last week that what he's what the, they're talking about here is uh, an example is in Zechariah, where the children of Israel are the are likened to an olive tree. And there is the image of the olive tree and the candlesticks. Now, today we know the candlesticks are the churches. We know that from the book of Revelation. But the candlesticks were in the temple. And it represents the people, if you're using that allegory. And it's straight in. Zechariah was shown the vision of the, the olive tree and the olive going straight into the candlestick. Lighting straight in. Not someone having to get it and, and, and squeeze the olive and put it in a vessel and bring it to the, to the, to the candle and, and light the candlestick. No, the olive tree, that's God talking directly, communing mouth to mouth with his people. And this is what she's longing for. So here you go, the allegory on the allegory. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Now, I favor between the man and the woman, but I want to give you the allegory on the allegory so that you understand some of the beauty and some of the applications that God wants you to be able to have. So that you know that when God deals with you this way, it's wonderful. God dealing with you anyway is wonderful. But mouth to mouth is the most intimate. The holiest of holies is where he wants to bring us. You know, Jesus said that 
uh, the, 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 the Gospels tell us that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the Father but by me. And now we know the Father just doesn't want to bring us into his house. Yes, because he said in my house are many mansions. You know, in my Father's house are many mansions. We're going to the Father's house. But ah, not just like that. In Song of Solomon, we see that not only does, does uh, she long to bring her lover home, and that's how we know that it's a place of righteousness, because it's the place where her mother uh, uh, had her. Uh, this is the, you only do that when it's righteous. And, <clears throat> and I know some of you are thinking about some things that you did when you were younger where it wasn't righteous. We're talking Song of Solomon, the allegory on the allegory. And, um, and she says these things out loud. So you didn't tell it all over the place when you were trying to do unrighteousness. She says these things and... We want to understand mouth to mouth. We want that intimacy, that holiest of holies. Now, it's okay in the courts when we're fellowshipping with one another and when we're, we're trading off our stories and our testimonies of how wonderful he is. That's, that's good. It's okay before the altar when we're praising and worshiping. That's wonderful. But ah, oh, that holiest of holies when it's just you and just God. And, and it's mouth to mouth. And that is the allegory on the allegory of that part. And so, uh, there's so much. There's so much. And I'm not trying to share it all. I thought I was going to try to share it all. But I realized I won't be able to share it all. But give you some of the allegory on the allegory so that you don't miss some of the wonder that's supposed to be between a man and a woman. And that's supposed to be between God and man, particularly you. All right, we're looking at the Song of Solomon. We're looking at the allegory on the allegory part two. And there's some principles that I've actually wanted you to get while we're looking at the word itself. Don't want it to be always principles, principles, principles without word. And so we've shown you some things. Now, the main thing 
is to understand that because there's allegory on the allegory, and you're going to see something completely different in one realm or dimension, uh, and, and you'll see somewhere else that it means something else. Don't make it that it, it, if it is yes here, then anything else is no. That's not the way it is. And the New Testament church likes to do that a lot. When we understand something, we don't let anything else in. We know better than that. We know better than that. You know better than that. When you learn your ABCs, you don't not let multiplication in. Whatever you, when you learn to read, you don't let, when you learn poetry, you don't not let in novels. When you learn history, you don't not let in uh, allegory. And so, one of the things that I really want you to understand as you look up things on Song of Solomon, you might find that the springs of water mean this. Well, it may. It may. And then you look up uh, another, and they'll tell you that it means that. First of all, the Holy Spirit is going to lead you and guide you. If, you're, if your heart's upright before the Lord, remember the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth to show himself mighty on behalf of whose heart is upright before him. So if your heart is upright before the Lord, the Holy Ghost is leading you and guiding you into all truth. So that understand that when you see the allegory on the allegory, it does not make every other allegory incorrect. Now there's a lot of them out there that are. <laughs> we, when I deal with the, the main event for Song of Solomon, and like I told you, I deal with the man from the woman. I show you the difference between erotica and sensuality. The Song of Solomon is very sensual. It's very intimate, very, very sensual without going unholy. Remember, I told you they're not married, so they're not consummating anything. And yet they are very, very sensual because when you love, you will be. And there's some other things in there that God wants you to know, that you'll have dreams. And, and even when you look at the allegory on the allegory, that the one that I'm mostly using has to do with it, the whole Shulamite girl is Israel. You see that there's times when Israel's right and there's times when Israel is wrong, but God is always loving. And sometimes his loving means he has to withdraw because you're just not ready for him. But he doesn't leave you with his presence. That's one of the reasons why the name of God is not in the Song of Solomon. It is not in the book because it's about his presence. Love has a presence. You want to understand that love has a presence. Whether you're talking about God's love for you, God's love for Israel, God's love uh, for an individual, God's love can be felt. It, had, it is his presence. And that when you learn that God's love is some other things, it doesn't mean that God's love is not presence. But love can be felt. Love is his presence. And so God can remove himself without removing his presence. How does he do that? There's other scriptures to show you, and then you still need it to be a revelation. But in the allegory on the allegory, you want to understand that about God in his presence. And and you want to be like Moses. Remember when God said, um, I'm going to send my angel with you. Now his angel is his presence. His, all the hosts carry God's presence. All the angels, no matter what rank they are, they carry God's presence. But Moses said, no, nah, I don't want an angel. I want you. And that's what in the whole metaphor, as God gives it, it is to bring this love to a place where nothing else will do but you. Oh, God. That's where all of this longing, all of this longing has to do with whether you're talking uh, a man with a maid, whether you're talking the journey of the soul, whether you're talking the history of Israel. All of the longing has to bring the female to the place of nothing else will do. And it, the male is always in a place of honor with his love. He's always in a place of righteousness with his love. So he looks at her as sister and as spouse, as friend, not as an object. Not even an object of love, but as a person. A person to protect his right his right hand doesn't brace me his left hand under my head 
ah, that he embraces and he comforts. You see, when he's fighting for you, his right hand isn't embracing you. It's got to be loose to fight. But that's a place of comfort. That the allegory on the allegory is always about the presence of God's love, no matter where we are. So that it brings us to him. So that it woos us to him. So that it causes that we, when we're not distracted by the sense of, I'm talking about the sense. Remember I told you last week that it's God's idea that cologne has uh, an effect. An effect on your insides, an effect on your mind. It's God's idea. The sweet smelling savor and God set up the temple worship so that we understood that there's so many things that are supposed to have myrrh and a sweet scent and a wonderful scent. And we're supposed to be a, a sweet smelling savor to the Lord. We are supposed to be New Testament saints. We're supposed to be a sweet smelling savor. God likes things that smell good. And he shows us in Song of Solomon that he smells good to us. That we know his scent. And his voice, ah, it turns our insides. Even in, um, even in the, the Hebrew, we understand it's that the liver. And it reminded me of, of some things that I learned in the world uh, different phrases and now I understand because man has an understanding, an innate understanding of some of the things of God, the way that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That we give him glory is what he's after. That we acknowledge him, that we come to him, that we desire him more than any other. And in every allegory on the allegory, it is always to understand that his love is so magnificent and we should pant after his love. We should go after him and nothing else will do. There's no substitute. There's nothing else will do. As when, when Moses said, God, your angel, that's nice. But I don't want an angel. I want you. I'm not going unless it's you. And God granted it to him. And all through the allegory, on the allegory, whether Israel is, is in exile or whether Israel is on Sinai, responding to the Lord and loving him as he loves them, no matter what, his love and his presence is constant. So the allegory on the allegory, the journey through the soul, it shows us that all of this is God's eternal purpose. It shows us that the will and to do of his good pleasure that comes from God because we come from him. He not only formed us in his image, but he blew the breath of life in us so that everything about us, it, it is connected to him. And when we disconnect, we have all kinds of trouble, whether it's psychological, whether it's physical, whether it's material, whether it's uh, relational with, you know, not just with God, but with family, with, with people. Remember when Cain slew his brother? Uh, it wasn't just, it wasn't enough. He got rid of his brother, but now he said that everybody's going to want to kill me. You see that when things aren't right with God and when we don't do things right, when we're in exile because of one thing or another, and remember, we don't go, we don't start out in exile. We don't start out doing the wrong thing because we're looking to do the wrong thing. That becomes a gradual, a gradual thing for having not kept our mind on the beloved, for not always dealing in the spring of waters, for not always going to the living waters, and for not paying attention of the waters that flow down from the mountains of Lebanon. We want to be as a watered garden. We want to always be that. And so that that allegory fits us, whether we're talking about us as a nation. I'm concerned about America. And so whether the allegory is with us as a nation with God, whether the allegory is our family. You know, she said that her brothers, they, they were so busy about their business that they, they gave her a vineyard to keep. Well, that was a good thing. But then they didn't help her and they didn't look after her. And she was so busy keeping her vineyard that... She didn't, she didn't take care of herself. And then on top of it, her brothers accused her when they found out that, ah, you're meeting this shepherd on the hillside unchaperoned. What? You know, the allegory on the allegory. When it's the, with Rashi, he's showing us that you're going out to other nations. You're doing what other nations are doing. What? 
Right now, in the United States, we're trying to go after another nation's uh, uh, health reform. It doesn't even work in the country we're taking it from. What? Ah, but find it from God. God has a health reform in his word. And in Song of Solomon, when you do the allegory on the allegory, you will always find yourself in the soul of songs, the holiest of holies, with the love of God in perfection. Amen. You are blessed and anointed of God. You are ablaze with the glory of God. God has blessed the work of your hands and you walk in favor with God and man. You think from the word and you make wise moves. You are blessed and excel in all that you do. You always attract people of wisdom and an excellent spirit and you engage in transactions and situations of vast, excellent and lasting merit. You are occupied with people and endeavors on a plane of timely, immediate, high and positive return in the internal, the external, and the eternal realm, in the temporal, the celestial, the natural, the spiritual, in the personal, interpersonal, community, national, and global. You move in all that pertains to life and godliness, according to the promises of God in all of their fullness. You are continuously and profoundly supplied in time, resources, wisdom, and health, in favor and finance, and all manner of wealth, in revelation and vision of things present and things to come, in the knowledge and understanding standing and zeal of the Holy One. You are called to His glory, His virtue, and His praise. You are elected to His power, His loving kindness, and His grace. You are clothed with humility, and you are prudent in matters. You are blessed and anointed, highly favored and appointed, and you are full of the Word of God and its demonstration. God has appointed your going out and your coming in. He has ordained that your very life exemplify Him. Righteousness, justice, and holiness unto the Lord is the mark of your call. And the resurrection power and the glory of God, you will fulfill all. You are blessed and anointed of God. You are ablaze with the glory of God.